Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have revealed yourself to us in your word. You have touched our hearts. And you've drawn us here today at this place, for, at this time, for the message that you have for us this day. Open our ears and our hearts to hear what you have for us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Proverbs 3.5 states, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And from today's scripture reading in the Gospel of John, he states, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And from the, the book of James, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Faith, trust, deeds, action. It's action, isn't it? Faith, both faith and trust are verbs. They require us to act. They're not passive. In today's culture, trust has become a major, major issue. When I was growing up, we never locked the back door. We never locked the front door. We never had to because we always, people knew us, and we knew that people would not enter without asking our permission. Forget that the next neighbor was a mile away. But how many of us now go to bed at night without making sure that we first lock our doors and secure everything? How many of us have had a crisis of trust recently? Where trust has been broken, where you trusted something to happen a particular way, and it didn't. Well, you know, we, we rationalize and we say, well, you know, I can trust Sarge to always act the same way he's always acted. <laughs> and that way I'll never be disappointed. Or I can say, I can't trust Barb to be a person of her word. This is, I'm using her as an example. I can trust her, believe me. We rationalize when we say we trust someone else. We rationalize when we say we trust someone else. These statements are so common today in our disintegration of trust within our city, within our culture, within our church even. Some of us don't trust our church to be a safe place. How many here have been hurt by a church? Okay, there are a few. We don't trust we don't trust that people or churches or institutions or groups are going to respond to us in the way that we need them to respond when we become vulnerable to them. Sometimes, though, we don't trust because someone has not responded in the way that's going to make us feel good. Sometimes we don't trust because people have not responded in the way that we think they need to in order for us to view ourselves in a different light. Today we have a crisis of intimacy in our community. Where from one person to another person to another person to another person we go, never finding that deep place of sharing, 
of trust, that deep place of vulnerability, because I don't dare give myself. I'll wait and see if the other gives first. And then I can give. I can let go. But never quite so much, because after all, I might get hurt. Trust is not predicting behavior of another. Trust is not analyzing the costs or the risk. Trust means making ourselves vulnerable to one another. Trust means getting real about who we are. Trust means getting real about who we are. Now, when I read from the verses from Proverbs 3, 5, I'm struck with two specific insights. That verse, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. Number one, if I'm going to trust God, I need to be vulnerable to God. I need to let the real me there before God. And I need not hold back because I'm afraid that he's going to judge me in the way that I judge myself. You see, that's my own understanding. So I lay myself out before the Lord. And he responds to me in love. When Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and likewise love your neighbor as yourself. He meant it. Yet, we find here and in our community a poverty of love. We find a poverty of love because there is a poverty of trust. Patrick Lencioni in his book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, asserts that trust is the foundation upon which a team is built. Trust is the foundation upon which a team is built. Remember that videotape we saw last week about the geese flying in formation, the V, the V formation? Remember the lead goose and all the geese that are following behind? Well, there is some trust. There is trust that that lead goose knows where that goose is going. That's a good goose. And God hardwires geese to be able to do that. God doesn't hardwire us in the same way. We're not geese. We have to learn how to do some of that. Do you know how God hardwires us, though? He hardwires us to desire intimacy with him. He hardwired us to desire intimacy with him. And yet, we don't let ourselves go there because we hold back. We hold back. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. Let's see. The heart. The heart. The seat of our emotions. The seat of our passions. The seat of our desire. That's the heart, isn't it? Now, what's our understanding? Our understanding is how we interpret those things that come from our heart, our passions, our emotions, our desires. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, all your emotions, all your passions, all your desires. And lean not on your own interpretation of what that should or should not look like, but what it really really is. In Jeremiah 17, verses 7 through 10, and you can read as we, as up here as I read along, 
Jeremiah the prophet says, but blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. It leaves, its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. What is this prophet saying? He's saying we need to clear the way to get real before the Lord. The Lord knows where our heart is, but in order for him to work the work that we need him to work in us, we need to allow him to be able to see us. How well can you see me? Some can see me well through this. But what's between you and I? I'm behind something, aren't I? Now, let me see. Can you see me? Can you see me better? <laughs> How about now? Okay. You can see me better now, right? Okay, this is what we do to God. We hold up before our God all of our dirt. Now, I don't mean the real dirt, because the dirt that we hold up before God is the artificial stuff. That's the stuff that we build our defenses with. And we say, God, here I am. God, aren't I great? And God says, I can't touch you. I can't come close to you. I can't be near you because you won't let me. I know what's there. But in order for me to come there and to be with you, I need to know the real you. And the real me and the real you is the one who is vulnerable to the Lord. The one who lays out everything, every emotion, every fear, every thought, every anxiety, everything that we thought we didn't measure up for, we lay out right before the Lord. When we do that, that's when he can, as a part of the vine, we are the branches then. He has the opportunity then to graft us into this vine that is him, that is divine, and to do in us what needs to be done in order to bear good fruit. Anybody here like real, honest-to-goodness fruit? Yeah, I do. I'm, I, I'm a fruit lover. Anybody prefer the artificial sweetened juice stuff above the real? No. I didn't think so. It'll do in a pinch. But it won't do with God. And it won't do with us either. God can only produce the real stuff when we present to him the real thing. Now, how do we know that we can trust God, though? How do we know that we can trust God? You know, some of us say, well, you know, how can I trust my imperfection with perfection? I mean, after all, God is perfect. If I lay, if, 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 if I lay out everything about me and all of my pimples and warts, 
before the Lord, he's, he who's perfect is going to say, I don't measure up. Right? That's where he wants us. He wants us there to say, this is who I am. This is who I believe I am, God. Now speak to me. And he will. Speak to me. And he will. How can I be open and honest with a God who is perfect? I can be open and honest to a God with a God who, has been, who is perfect in every way because that God identifies with me. Do you know how? Through Jesus, yes. This is a God, the God that we serve, the God that we love, is the God who loves us enough that he said, they appear to be suffering. I created them to have fellowship with me. Where are they? Let me understand from their perspective what it's like to be them. And so God comes in the form of Jesus Christ. As much man as if not God at all, as much God as if not man at all. And a perfect man by the way, one who did not have an evil thought, an evil deed, an evil word for anyone. Yet, because he was human, he was tempted. And remember last week we said, how were we tempted? Possessions, ego, and pride. And he was tempted in all those ways, yet he remained perfect. And what did humanity do to a perfect image? It reacted to it, didn't it? Just as God knew it would. And he was tortured. He was rejected. He was reviled. He was beaten. And he was ultimately crucified with the weight of the sin of every single one of us. With the weight of all the defenses that we put up. With the weight of all the ways in which we act. That we say, we need to measure up or I need to be better than you or I need this or I need that or I need the other. That sin. That nailed him to a cross. And he was buried. But because he's God, he became victorious over that grave. And the good news is that he lives today. And he lives in our hearts to the degree that we allow him to live there. He can't live where we take over. He can't live where we Hold the space. There isn't room for both of us. The God who knows us and who sees through all of our defenses is the God who can meet us on the mountain and the God who meets us in the valley. Anybody here had mountaintop experiences? Yes. Praise God. Anybody here had valley experiences where you were so low? Yeah. I see about a third of the population here as being open and honest. <laughs> Shall I get out the plexiglass again? I'll pass it around. When we regain our trust, we regain it by action. That is, by becoming vulnerable to God 
and vulnerable to each other. Now, if Sarge and I, I keep picking on Sarge because he's sitting here bright as day, but let's say Sarge and I are going on a trip and we have a task to do and it's going to take two of us to do it, but I don't trust Sarge to do his work equally with mine. What am I going to do? What kind of attitude am I going to have, Dano? Yes, because I have judged him not living up to my expectations before we get across, before we get there. Now, if I, on the other hand, if Sarge and I, before we take this journey, we sit down one on one together and we say, here's the journey, here's where we're going, here's what we need to do. Now, Sarge, I fear, please don't hear me the wrong way, but I, I fear I'm going to have to do more work and, I, and, and, and that bothers me. And Sarge can say, well, you haughty twit. <laughs> or Sarge can say, wow, I didn't know you were feeling that way. I know what that feels like. I've been there before. And Sarge admits that he was having some of the same feelings because he wanted to make sure that he didn't have to overwork either. So, Sarge and I come together in a place of trust because we have shared with each other where each of us is coming from. We do it in unity. We do it in fellowship. We do it in koinia, the true fellowship of God, because we have been honest with each other before God. Faith in action before God requires that we dump our cart every day. Hear me? Dump our cart every day before the Lord, not on another. Dump our cart before the Lord. All of that stuff that we would keep and hold on to each day before the Lord, whether it's on our knees, whether it's on our back, lying in bed, whether it's driving to work, hopefully not being distracted, but dump that cart on the Lord. Because that is where the Lord comes to meet us. When the cart is empty, he'll crawl in. And it's very, very, very important that we not try to seek the feeling. It's very important that we not try to seek the feeling. Why? Because the feeling can be deceiving. The feeling can be deceiving. Now, when we seek God, there are feelings that happen, right? But when we seek the feeling, it doesn't mean that it's God. So we have to make sure that we don't put the cart before the horse. I'll tell you a little story. There was this woman from the Midwest who was blind, and all of her life she had dreamed of coming to the shore in Florida. Well, friends of hers bought her a round-trip ticket to Fort Lauderdale. And when she landed in Fort Lauderdale and checked into her hotel, she uh, summoned a taxi and uh, went directly to the beach over here in Fort Lauderdale. When she got to the edge of the beach, when she found her way to the edge of the beach, she took off her shoes and she stepped into the sand. Now imagine with me the feel of the sand on your feet around your feet. Well, to her, this was the most wonderful feeling in the world. Finally, she had reached her dream of stepping in the warm sand of the beach of Florida. Well, she flew back to 
this town in the Midwest, all happy and secure, knowing that she had had that experience. A few months later, some friends of hers invited, them, invited her to join them at an amusement park. And this amusement park was built around the lake. And as they were walking along the lake, the friends invited her to take off her shoes. She did. And she exclaimed, How on earth did you get Florida here? Funny. But it's so true about what we do. We equate that feeling. That feeling that she had was no more Florida than the feeling that we seek to replace or to be God. You see, God is the God of the mountain, and he's the God in the valley. The feeling that we have of God at the mountain is only a glimpse of him. The feeling that we have down here, we can still glimpse, glimpse him because he's with us here. It doesn't mean that he doesn't exist. So, God is the God of all of us at all times. Expand our thought, our ideas of God, and we really begin to grow in him and we can grow in him, one with another. Why this sermon this week? Last week, we opened the door to talk about where we're going as a church. And that we need to go in, uni in unity. We need to be in unity, in leadership, and in all aspects of our church as to where we're going. And why? because there's a whole community out here, a whole world. We reach far beyond Fort Lauderdale. We reach Australia, we, we, we reach um, Europe, we reach Canada. We're reaching all around folks. And in order for us to be reaching our goal, the goal that he has in mind for us, the future, we have to be doing this in a place of trust. A place of trust that he knows where we're going. A place of trust with one another. And that requires that we are vulnerable one with another. It means that we take those emotions when we feel them and not ignore them but let them tell us where we are and share them one with another. Because until we know where we are, how can we know how to help each other along the path? I'd like to share a song with you now. About knowing who holds tomorrow. I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine or its sky. I don't see to understand. 
the one who stands by me and the path that be my portion may be through the flame or flood but his breath don't know about tomorrow. We have a vision of tomorrow that you've given us. We have a direction that we hear you calling. And we are thankful, Heavenly Father, that you have brought all of us together at this place for such a time as this. But because we know that you hold the future, and that you hold tomorrow, we trust with all that we are in the depths of our hearts, in the depths of our being, we trust you to be the God of your promise, to lead us for the glory of your kingdom and your kingdom alone, not for our pleasure, not for our joy alone, but for the pleasure and joy of your kingdom, that others may hear the good news that because of your love, we, as your created, are measured up in your eyes. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the knowledge that the person that I think I ought to be, for the person that I think I should be. For the, thing, for the person that I know I never am really doesn't matter. But what does matter, Lord, is the person you say I am because of your Son, Jesus Christ. And may we, Heavenly Father, seek to understand more about what that looks like for each of us as we trust one another with our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.